students. So far, we've covered a lot of topics on adult nutrition. Today, we're going to dwell on pediatric nutrition. Um, children with malnutrition are very common in developing countries. As a result of which, uh, you see delayed growth achievement of growth milestones. In a lot of these countries, the reason for malnutrition is inadequate food supply. It could be caused because of social, economic, and environmental factors. In hospitals, however, we see secondary malnutrition, secondary to the underlying disease that the children are suffering from. And this may be caused because of a number of reasons like abnormal, abnormal, abnormal loss of nutrients, or it could be an increased uh, energy requirement or energy expenditure or decreased food intake. Many a times, a combination of all three. Unlike adult nutrition, pediatric nutrition, and particularly enteral nutrition, is quite critical. And today, we have two be uh, very well-known experts in the field to talk about this topic so that children get the right kind of care, right kind of nutrition at the right stage. So we have one of the speakers talking about management of severe acute malnutrition in the community setup. And the second speaker is going to talk about management of malnutrition in hospitalized pediatric patients. Now, of course, uh, today's time is limited, so we're not going to cover the vast majority of different conditions, but we're going to try and do our best. And a lot of questions will be taken in the panel discussion as well. Now, before I introduce the speaker, let me quickly reiterate the rules and regulations. Certificate of attendance will be given for all those who attend all 10 sessions followed by an objective test. Attendance for the complete session is mandatory for all sessions. An objective test will be 100 marks test. This will be given to you via Google form. This will be given to you after the session on 8th March. It will not be emailed to you. It will be displayed in the chat box. Minimum 80% is required to pass the test. Feedback for all sessions is mandatory. Feedback link is posted at the end of the session. Please make copy and keep it with you. We'll not be sharing the same on the email again. Questions can be posted in Q&A box and will be taken during the panel discussion. All comments, suggestions can be posted in the chat box. Those of you who are attending from the YouTube link will not be eligible for the certificate, but you're welcome to come and learn from the sessions that have happened. So it's a privilege to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Alka Jadav, ma'am. She is a professor of pediatric gastroenterology at Sion Hospital, Mumbai. And she's going to talk on nutrition in malnourished pediatric patients. Ma'am is an in, in charge pediatric gastroenterology at the Sion Hospital. She's a professor of pediatrics as well. And she's a course coordinator faculty for MSc in pediatric nutrition in SVT College, Juhu. She has immense experience in the field of treating children with malnutrition, and she has over 30 papers to her credit. I welcome you, ma'am, to present. I'll quickly share your presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Very good evening. I welcome you all to this our pediatric session, and I am thankful to Hexagon Nutrition Private Limited for involving me as a teacher for you all. I'm sure. Shall we start? As we have said, uh, my topic for the day is nutrition in malnourished pediatric patients. Okay, next. As you know, of course, nutrition, good nutrition forms the backbone of all of us. Our children, they survive, they grow, develop, learn, play, and participate as well as contribute significantly. But malnutrition really robs the children of their future and leaves you with hanging in imbalances of malnutrition. So malnutrition is defined by Aspen as imbalance between the nutrient requirement, nutrient intake, which results in deficit of energy, proteins, micronutrients, either individually or together. Next. Is my talk clear? Means the words and everything? Yes, ma'am. No problem. No? See, we use this word hunger very, very commonly. 
so if you really go to see we have uh, we uh, hunger is defined as not enough food to eat so obviously when the child says i am hungry the mother gives him the full but believe me in the world there are around 1 billion hungry people every who are suffering from malnutrition this depicts the global hunger index of the 127 2021 india is 107th on global hunger index next see malnutrition this is a significant problem not only in developing countries but also it is in developed worlds so acute malnutrition if you really go to see is responsible for one third of the deaths in children under 5 years of age it contributes to impairment in the intellectual as well as the cognitive impairment in children so effectively it reduces the potentials of the adult if he is a malnourished child okay so globally around 101 million children are malnourished so malnutrition actually our target the wh world health assembly wishes that preventing malnutrition prevalence bringing down less than 5% by 2025 is the target which needs to be achieved and all of us we need to work on it next if you really see overt hunger we have really seen but what is hidden hunger this terminology actually we all see uh, there is lack of balance in otherwise full diet so there are around more than 2 billion people suffering from hidden hunger so hidden hunger is nothing but the multiple micronutrient deficiency it's called as hidden hunger next see we divide these micronutrients into type 1 micronutrients and type 2 micronutrients you will ask me what are micronutrients micronutrients are vitamins and minerals which are present in the body for performing some function maybe enzymatic function and promoting the growth like we have zinc which has a immune function we have potassium which gives us energy for muscle contraction various vitamins are also there so these type both type 1 and type 2 micronutrients are very very essential part of our diet next if we really do have deficiencies of these micronutrients type 1 micronutrient deficiency if you really see that it affects the functioning the cognitive impairment but type 2 micronutrient especially the zinc and the selenium deficiency it affects the growth it gives rise to stunting so we really have to be careful where we need both the micronutrients next so what is india in fact the world is facing a double burden of malnutrition on one side we have undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies and on other side we have a practice of eating junk foods giving rise to overweight obesity problems along with that they overweight children may also have malnutrition so both of them they can coexist so we really have to tackle with double burden of malnutrition or in fact triple burden the overweight obesity undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies per se okay so it today's thing we are discussing undernutrition and undernutrition related problems next so this is about our double burden of malnutrition okay next see if you really use the term under nutrition you have to be very very clear in various terminologies like underweight wasting stunting so what is underweight underweight is if you really we go weight by age if the child is say 1 uh, 5 kilo weight and he is weighing 5 uh, kg weight and he is 1 year of age 
so we have who growth charts for plotting the charts so if the child is less than might minus 2 standard deviation weight for age he is called underweight and what is wasting or acute malnutrition if his weight for height is less than minus 2 standard deviation on world health organization growth charts it is called wasting about the wasting we are going to discuss further so wasting is nothing but an acute malnutrition where his height is relatively preserved and weight is lost acutely and what is stunting stunting is a marker of chronic undernutrition so his height for age less than minus 2 standard deviation it's called stunting okay so we divide this acute wasting or acute malnutrition into two categories the moderate acute malnutrition and severe acute malnutrition next so what is severe acute malnutrition see pediatric age group in india we take it from birth till 12 years of age so if you really go to see severe acute malnutrition is the term used for children between 6 months to 5 years of age where we really have to go for wait for there are three criteria which can be used for defining severe acute malnutrition so in severe acute malnutrition we have weight for length or weight for height less than minus 3 standard deviation on who growth charts behind or they have visible severe wasting mid upper arm circumference less than 11.5 cm and edema of both the feet though who has not included visible severe wasting in their definition indian government still continues to add this as part of severe acute malnutrition so for children under 6 months of age we do not use the term sam we use the term called ftt or failure to thrive in failure to thrive if the child is weight for length which is less than minus 3 standard deviation or child has either edema or visible severe wasting or if the child is weighing less than 3.5 kg beyond 2 months of age it is called as ftt or failure to thrive okay just go back one slide please now we have the terminology called severe thin severe thin there are two definitions the child between 5 to 9 years of age and child between 10 to 18 years of age so if your body mass index is less than minus 3 standard deviation on the growth chart or mid upper arm circumference less than 129 and 160 cm respectively or presence of nutritional bilateral pitting edema it is called as severe thin child so these terminologies i have given more time so you understand that malnutrition is not only the problem for under 5 but it is problem for older children also next next so after this we go to a moderate acute malnutrition that is defined as between weight for the same criteria but mid upper arm circumference between 11.5 to 12.5 cm or weight for length between minus 2 to minus 3 z score so this severe acute malnutrition we really divide it into two parts primary severe acute malnutrition and secondary severe acute malnutrition primary severe acute malnutrition is mostly because of social causes like premature baby lack of breastfeeding inappropriate complementary feeding practices too many children poverty etc 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 
but secondary severe acute malnutrition is probably an organic cause or it is also called as organic malnutrition related to the disease like hiv liver disease cystic fibrosis heart disease etc etc so that's why first time when we are seeing a child complete clinical examination of a child is very very essential next see if you really see this this is an example where you are showing bilateral pitting edema this is a apathetic child who is on recovery has a smiling face this is a child who is having visible severe wasting next so why we are worried about severe acute malnutrition that is because it has a lot of high mortality of around 25 between 10 to 25% and as the child is younger the mortality is higher and up to 18 months of age is related to infections and that's the reason why we are worried about severe acute malnutrition because we don't want to lose human lives next see you have seen this child such a failure to thrive child who is 4 or 5 months old failure to thrive this is baggy chicks with edematous malnutrition next so as you all understand child is not the miniature of the adult the same way a malnourished child is not the miniature of a small child there are definitely changes that occur in the body all throughout like you have growth restriction loss of fat muscle and visceral mass you have hormones which are affected mainly the low levels of thyroid hormones insulin low levels of growth hormones so and low levels of igf and elevated levels of growth hormone the cellular immunity is affected so they are more predisposed to severe infection but what is more worrying is they have villus atrophies the intestine the brush border lining of the intestine undergo lot of atrophic changes even the pancreas will undergo atrophic changes so that makes the nutrition rehabilitation very special and also you have electrolyte imbalances and effect on the heart next so whenever we are seeing a child who is malnourished we really have to undergo the total process one nutrition specific clinical examination the nutrition diagnosis planning of nutrition intervention you have to do the monitoring and evaluation and ultimately you have to take the measures so that the malnutrition does not recur in the same child or in the family with any other members so this process we have to follow so malnutrition is a family illness rather than an individual illness okay next so we have to see the nutrition focus physical examination which includes anthropometry that is measurement of the bodies look for the features of micronutrient deficiencies vitamin a vitamin d iron deficiency look for signs of complications look for infection and the biggest problem is or big most important thing is you look for the appetite test whether the child is able to eat and we can send him home or the child needs to be admitted because he is not eating well we do not really require laboratory tests unless only in hardly 4 or 5% of the children because cl good clinical examination gives you majority of the times the diagnosis next see so you look for edema and we grade the edema as 1 plus 2 plus and 3 plus mild moderate and severe next then you measure the mid upper arm circumference with the help of a non stretchable tape it is also called a muak tape or a shakir tape where you take a midpoint between the olecranon and the 
क्लैविक एंड यू टेक द मिड पॉइंट एंड मेजर इट अराउंड सो दिस म्यूआक इज वेरी वेरी इम्पॉर्टंट यूजिंग अ म्यूआक टेप नेक्स्ट then you have to measure a height where points are reaching the stadiometer the back of the head the back but buttocks and the legs uh, the heel point so you have to have the appropriate height measurement with the help of a stadiometer next those so after you have measured the weight and you measured the height you plot it on a wait for length chart and wait for height chart okay so depending on the age length is what we take if the child is less than 2 years and height when we say it is if the child is more than 2 years so you plot it and see whether he falls into a red zone or an orange zone if he is falling into orange zone he is moderate acute malnutrition if it is in the red zone it is severe acute malnutrition next so this is the who growth chart which all of you must be familiar with we plot it as minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 so either you plot it on this growth chart so that when he comes subsequently for follow up the mothers can actually see the charts okay whether he is growing he's flat or he is going down next so whenever we are seeing so which are the children which are the acutely malnourished children which needs special attention or the special care what we call them as red flag signs one age less than 1 year so malnutrition in a child less than 1 year second if there is edematous malnutrition a child who fails the appetite test child who has come back with sam his relapse or child having the medical complication or any associated infection like hiv tuberculosis so all the children definitely need inpatient care and cannot be managed at a community level next so our aim in treatment is to reduce the mortality and morbidity of the treatment in sam so identify them at early you triage them and manage according to the decision whether you want to have a facility based care or a community based care next so this is the algorithm or the if you decide to go for a facility based care these are the 10 steps so of which we are not going to cover for six steps but you have to as a doctor you have to look at the medical complications after the medical complications you you are identified start doing the necessary treatment for medical complication and start with cautious feeding okay so we start from step 7 till step 10 next so so initially what we call it as a stabilization phase in this stabilization phase we start with a cautious feeding we begin with f75 f75 actually gives 75 kilo calories per 100 cc it is a low osmolarity feed and it actually helps in early initial recovery or initial stabilization phase after the child is okay from f75 he goes to the transition phase in this transition phase child is showing the improvement like disappearance of the fever little appetite trying to return back he starts losing edema so we shift from f75 to f100 that gives 100 kilo calories per 100 cc and after this 3 4 days we perform in a sick child we perform the appetite test after that and he passes the appetite test we go to a rehabilitation phase especially with a special diet which is ready to use therapeutic food 
so we will learn about this process over a period of time next so this rehabilitation phase or ready to use therapeutic food is actually revolutionized the treatment of severe acute malnutrition in uh, uh, last 20 years it is energy dense protein rich therapeutic food the, why this is required because malnourished children are not the miniature of the child they have a lot of changes which have occurred in the body they they have small stomach capacity they cannot consume large volumes so we require this rutf next next so what happens in children we have lot of uh, this rutf is to be given if the child passes appetite test okay so whenever you have loss of appetite the studies have revealed that there are a lot of metabolic abnormalities like liver dysfunction membrane damage that is happening some occult infection or hidden infection also can be there and there is an immediate risk of death because of hypoglycemia and sepsis next so after we shift from f75 and f100 we go to the appetite test this is a yellow in the yellow is an appetite test chart so we have as we give the ready to use therapeutic food as per his weight band if he passes the appetite test the child can be easily managed on outpatient treatment but he fails the appetite test he needs to be having an inpatient till he passes the appetite test and clears the medical complication next so the stabilization phase lasts for about two days initial phase one so there we start treatment for infection and treatment of hypoglycemia hypothermia next so little more about starter diet or therapeutic uh, 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 pill f75 this F75 promotes the recovery of the normal metabolic function and electrolyte imbalances. It is a low osmolarity food. It gives energy of 70 and proteins to maintain the basic physiological process. And it does not bring rapid weight gain, which is dangerous in early phases. So it just keeps the body maintaining, giving them enough required energy and proteins okay next so whenever we are giving f75 we still need to continue with the breastfeeding okay so we start with f75 diet every two hourly so we give small frequent feeds continue in breastfeeding in between so that child does not go into hypoglycemia this we do it on the first day after say, first day, we can go every three hourly or four hourly feeds. Next. So this is the starter diet lookup chart. So depending on the weight band, you can give the amount as well as the feed, whether you want to give two hourly feed, three hourly feed or four hourly feed. So accordingly, you can give it. Next. So once the child has little gain in the appetite, his medical complications are getting stabilized. He doesn't have nasogastric tube feeding and edema starts coming down. From after two days, we shift to a transition phase. Next. So this transition phase, we actually start with a new therapeutic milk that is F100 without adding iron why we don't add iron because infection is still not under control and if you give iron the infection will flare up so this transition phase lasts for about four days 
usually around two to three days and explore the possibility of using RUTA. Next. So in this transition phase, we have protein which gives rise to around 10 to, it gives 10 to 12% of the total energy. So one gram per kg of proteins, it gives fat, it gives sodium which is required for the body. And it has low osmolarities, 330 milliosmoles. So it is good for little weight gain or resolving the edema. Next. So after this transition phase, we really, that they start gaining, tissue start gaining weight. And we start with 100, 100 kilocalories and six pills in a day. So we start with around six feeds and we don't give this transition milk every two hourly. We give it four hourly. Next. So from transition phase to phase two, if we have to see if the child is free from complications, appetite returns, child finishes more than 75% of the feed and edema starts to subside, we change to Phase two, next. This is the phase two or amount of F100 to be given as a lookup table. It is easily available on the net, next. See, we have it available. We commercial F75 and F100 preparations are available. Though some nutrition centers, they make indigenously F75 and F100. We do commer we use commercial preparations. Next. So the mixed feeding is, uh, we start slowly, we introduce the ready to use therapeutic food or RUTF. So in the phase two of the transition phase, so we give alternate feeds of F100 along with RUTF. So we give around four feeds of F100 and four feeds of ready to use therapeutic food. And once the child is able to take, has a good appetite, totally switch to RUTF. Next. So this RUTF in community-based ma management, how do we use? RUTF is actually very, very indicated in community-based management of SAM. One, it provides all the nutrients required for the recovery so it has around 21 micronutrients which are added. It has a good shelf life. It does not spoil, get spoiled very easily even after opening. It has no water base. So bacterial growth is very limited. It is safe. It can be stored at room temperature. It is sweet. It is liked by children. It is easy to be administered even without medical supervision. And it can be used along with breastfeeding. So it does not replace breastfeeding. I'm repeating it again. It does not replace breastfeeding. It is given in addition to breastfeeding. And it needs to be given. It's a medicine. You just have to give it for a period of 8 to 12 weeks till the child recovers from SAM. Next. So this ready next, this ready to use therapeutic food is not the rocket science. It is made from peanut paste, soybean oil, powdered sugar, micronutrients. They are put in a mixer and then it, they are packed. It does not require cooking and it lasts for two years. So it is really ready to use. Next. So we ha still have hospital. We do prepare indigenously RUTF in our hospital. It is available commercially also. Next. So next. See, this picture itself is self-explanatory. It gives rise to the 500 ml, uh, 100 grams of RUTF gives 500 kilocalories. You need to drink one bowl of khichdi or rice mung dal paste 
to meet the same calories and it will still not give those micronutrients. Next. So this is the RUTF lookup chart as per WHO. It can be given till 60 kg. So RUTF can be used even in adults with my, my acute malnutrition. Next. So whenever we are giving ready to use therapeutic food, we really have to monitor the children. Is it enough? Is the child getting enough? So we really monitor the weight and mid upper arm circumference weekly and height every fortnightly. If the weight gain is less than five gram per kg per day, obviously the child is not eating well. It is a poor recovery. Between five to 10 gram per kg is a moderate recovery. More than 10 gram per kg, you should be happy. Praise the mother and the child for taking good RUTF. Next. So this rehabilitation phase, our aim is to promote the rapid weight gain and stimulate the emotional support and prepare for normal feeding at home. Don't forget, RUTF is not for lifetime. You just have to give it for eight to 12 weeks. So this rehabilitation phase, we have two components. When the RUTF is available, it is a treatment of choice, either commercial or locally prepared. When RUTF is not available, you still have to go for supplements and augmented home food. Next. So we have facility-based management for SAM with complications. We have facility-based management followed by outpatient-based management with RUTF. So those who have recovered can go home and come back to the facility for follow-up. Then we have community-based management program with RUTF or energy-dense nutritional substances. And we have community-based management with supplementary feeding program, which is less suboptimal. Okay, so maybe supplementary feeding program may be augmented home food or a take-home ration or a locally prepared corn soya blend. So these are the few things. But whatever program is feasible in your area, locality, government guidelines, nutrition counseling is still a must. Next. So uncomplicated. Now, since we have dealt with facility-based care, now we come to the uncomplicated SAM children because that forms the major chunk. Around 90% of these SAM children are without any complications and they are silently being seen in the community. They can be successfully managed at home. So we have development of uh, this RUTF has really made it possible to move away from hospital-based approach. We do give RUTF as 5.5 kilocalories per gram. So, or as per the RUTF lookup table, depending on the weight. So, along with that, we continue with nutrition counseling. And we, after 12 weeks of recovery, we definitely try to shift to home-based diet. We continue breastfeeding practices if the child is being breastfed. Next. So, in conclusion, for SAM, RUTF or energy dense nutritious supplements for acute malnutrition has evolved over several decades. These are the words of wisdom. It's a gold standard for management of severe acute malnutrition, but it still has a, remains uncertainty for India about the best products to be used in community context. Next best is supervised supplementary feeding program, which really aims to bridge the gap between by demonstrating the benefits, affordability, acceptability, and sustainability, because they all feel that RUTF is expensive and may re replace the breastfeeding practices. Next. 
so who now we come to all these times we have dealt with sam but now we come to moderate acute malnutrition so moderate acute malnutrition is uh, children who still need to be tackled and they need to be tackled with ready to use supplementary foods they are commonly used for moderate acute malnutrition these are the foods which are similar to rutf composition but gives their less energy density it gives around 400 kilo calories and 12 grams of proteins so along with nutritional counseling we need to continue next so in india we still have supervised supplementary feeding program by government mainly in the form of take home rations bala amruta provision of skim milk powder and many other modalities which are the used for mam children to prevent it from going into sam sam children next so this community based management of acute malnutrition realizes that facility based malnutrition is not a suitable solution and must be accompanied by preventive interventions so active case finding is critically important and cmam was effective in improving the follow up of admitted children so they can go to the community and they are followed by the healthcare workers so mam management by community workers and healthcare is essential next so we have various types of uh, management food management so we have commercially prepared rutf indigenously or locally prepared rutf you may use augmented home foods or amylase rich foods and we have standard diet which can be given in more amount next so i think when will the pro child be discharged from the program once he is enrolled into severe acute malnutrition when he reaches the weight for age which is more than minus 2 standard deviation so when he comes out of the acute malnutrition he is can be discharged from the program and he ne next and then he needs to be followed up every monthly for a period of next 4 months to prevent the recurrence next so next i have covered this child so parents should be advised little more about children with failure to thrive in india what we have children who are weighing less than 3.5 kg and mothers who complain of less milk output we definitely use supplementary suckling techniques okay the details will be discussed maybe some other time next okay so in supplementary suckling technique we use either diluted f100 or f75 and monitor the growth 80% of the times we succeed in relactating the mother and child goes back to exclusive breastfeeding next so in older children also the treatment severe thin children beyond 5 years of age and hiv positive children we need to encourage them to give apart from rutf lot of traditional or augmented food as much as possible next so we really have to have a program strategy which can have a case finding facility based treatment community based treatment these three have to work with hands in hand and together you cannot have only facility based care and you cannot have only community based care so it has to be a conjoint effort of facility along with community based care and case finding and implementation of preventive strategies next so i think i thank you for your time i think questions will be taken up after the thing i owe my presentation to all my team members thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for such a comprehensive you know for comprehensively covering the topic um time was 
thought otherwise we would have loved to listen to you and uh, we would have loved to listen to more stories about success stories about treating malnutrition in the community setting um as you rightly said we will be taking the questions in the panel discussion uh, so i request you to wait till the end without further ado let me start with the introduction of the next speaker It's again my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Jashree Paranspe, Madam. Ma'am is a senior dietitian at VYL Nair Hospital, Mumbai, and she'll be talking on enter nutrition in pediatric patients. She is also the co-convener or vice president of IDA Mumbai chapter. She's been working in VYL Nair Hospital. It's a government speciality, a multi-speciality hospital for more than 32 years. She's a certified diabetes educator, registered dietitian, and an RD trainer. And she's worked with the government uh, as a member of the post-COVID-19 protocol development group, the government of Maharashtra. She's also been an in charge of various government programs with respect to midday meal program, MCGM initiatives, lead diabetes, etc. I welcome ma'am to start her presentation. Thank you, Supada. Uh... I will share my presentation. Ma'am, your video is off. Yeah, yeah. I will switch on the video once my presentation. Uh, I get my presentation on. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah. My presentation is visible. Yes, Yes, ma'am. Uh, now I will start my video. Okay, so good evening, uh, one and all. It's my privilege to be part of this uh, training session. We welcome all the uh, participants who have made it a point uh, to be part of this uh, elaborate uh, program, which is organized by uh, Hexagon Nutrition uh, with the uh, Indian Dietetic Association, Mumbai chapter. Uh, and uh, this program is uh, the brainchild of uh, Sukhada, our treasurer. So thank you, Exogan. Thank you, Sukhada and IDA Mumbai chapter for making it uh, possible for all of our international uh, students and the dietitians who are there. Uh, today, My today's topic is enteral nutrition in uh, pediatric patients. Now in our first presentation, right at the beginning, Salome Benjamin ma'am has told us about enteral nutrition. So the uh, what is meant by gastrostomy feeding, vaginostomy feeding and all of that, I may not be covering, but I will be focusing more on the indication and contraindications uh, uh, of enteral nutrition support in pediatric patient. Again, as Sukhadar rightly said, we will not be covering uh, the special cases, but it is very general talk because the because of positive time. Now going to uh, going further. Always, whenever there is a small baby who comes to us for uh, enteral nutrition support, these are the questions which come to our mind. First is when to start feeding, where, as in the site of feeding, what to give and how much to give. And today we will try to, you know, answer these questions uh, to the best of my ability. So the objective of today's talk is to see the history when it all, uh, when it all began. Um, sorry, just excuse me for a minute because I, uh, the, the battery of my laptop is, you know, low. I'll just switch on the battery and restart. Okay, ma'am.
Hello. Sorry, I'm extremely sorry for that. So uh, the objective is to check the history when it all began, the indication for enteral nutrition support, the delivery modes, components of feeding, and monitoring and safety related to EN for pediatric patients. So it all began right in from 18th century when John Hunter designed orogastric probe through which he gave things like jelly, egg, milk, and so on and so forth. And by the time it was 1960s, it, um, it led to advanced understanding of nutrient needs and design of liquid formulation. And now we are in 2023. So the science from 18th century has evolved over a period of centuries. Yeah, so to begin, Whenever any patient comes to hospital, now in earlier lecture, ma'am has made it very easy for me because she spoke about malnutrition, hidden hunger and all of that. Now, whenever any patient comes to hospital facility, the first thing that is required is proper diagnosis followed by a good treatment. Now, the treatment could mean a medical management and or surgical management. Now, over a period of time, uh, the medical fraternity has realized that the treatment, be it medical or surgical, is, um, I mean, if you want a good outcome, the nutrition status of the patient and the proper nutrition, uh, uh, pop, uh, giving proper nutrition to the patient enhances recovery, decreases the length of hospital stay and gives a good outcome. And that's why the interest in nutrition therapy and now too it is called medical nutrition therapy. In terms of pediatric population, they require special attention because the demands are diverse in uh, for proper growth and nutrition, which are not necessarily because of illness, but it is also because they are growing children. When we say pediatric population, uh, it encompasses a very large group beginning from 0 to 12 years. So you can realize the how much is the, uh, I mean, how much the demand is diverse for that particular age group. And here it is not only about the child, but we also have to think about quality of life of the parents and the caregivers, especially if the child is going to be discharged and he has to be given enteral nutrition support at uh, home. So when we are planning their uh, nutrition uh, therapy, we have to even keep in mind the quality of the life of parents and the caregivers. Also, this big age group, 0 to 12 years, have different requirements in terms of calories, protein, the nutrients, as well as the psychological approach. So we will uh, come to the point now. Uh, what are the real clinical indications for pediatric enteral nutrition. Now, if the, uh, the suggested criteria for uh, when to begin enteral nutrition is insufficient oral intake, where there is inability to meet 60 to 80 percent of individual requirement for more than 10 days, and total feeding time in disabled uh, child is more than four to six hours per day. If there is wasting and stunting, so in case of wasting and stunting, we will, uh, you know, elaborate it a bit more about this part in, in the following slides. But uh, when there is inadequate growth or weight gain for more than a month in child who is younger than two years, or there is weight loss or no weight gain for more than three months in older child, older than two years, or child whose weight um, over two growth channels on growth charts, there is no change, or the tricep skin fold, which is consistently less than 50 percentile. So these are the various uh, suggested criteria when you have to think about uh, giving uh, enteral nutrition support. Also, sometimes uh, it is meant as a, a treatment for the diseases, like say, fructose intolerance, primary lactose intolerance or food allergies, Crohn's disease. So it can be any one of that. Now also we will see, um, as I said, that we will elaborate it a little more further, that in case of insufficient oral intake, 
nutrition support should be initiated within five days at the age of one year and within three days if the child is less than one year of age. Again, here <clears throat> we have, uh, I mean, uh, this slide also talks about further about whatever I have spoken in the previous slide, uh, where there is, if the, even if there is decreased velocity of more than uh, less than two centimeters per year during pu puberty, so all these are various reasons why uh, enteral nutrition support may be given. Now we will go uh, talk about, uh, uh, because initially we said if there is inadequate oral intake. Now, inadequate oral intake could be because of disorders of uh, sucking or swallowing, like maybe because of the child is premature or there is a neurological impairment like cerebral palsy, dysphagia, or trachoesophageal fistulas, tumors, oral cancers, trauma, critical illness, uh, food aversion, mechanical ventilation, any of these. Okay, now also there could be disorders of gastrointestinal motility, whereas there is pseudo uh, obstruction, extensive ileo, that is Hirschsprung disease, or increased nutritional requirements and losses in cases like cystic fibrosis or chronic solid organ disease, in case of chronic malnutrition, in case of uh, uh, conditions like Crohn's uh, disease and metabolic diseases. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what are the goals of nutrition support? Firstly, to provide appropriate amount of energy and other nutrients to support optimal growth and development while preserving body composition, minimizing gastrointestinal symptoms. Now, in certain cases, that minimizing gastrointestinal symptoms become the first goal, followed by providing appropriate energy and other nutrients because if the child comes with say acute diarrhea so the first goal has to be minimizing the symptoms rather than thinking about providing appropriate uh, nutrition it's specific nutri uh, nutrition uh, therapy then also the pro to promote developmentally appropriate feeding habits and skills of also uh, i mean these are of course the long term goals so whenever patient comes in the hospital, there are going to be some short-term goals and then there will be long-term goals which are to be achieved over a period of time because malnutrition doesn't happen um, uh, you know, overnight. Similarly, it cannot be treated overnight. And prevent malnutrition rather than being delayed until the child has already been exposed to its immediate or long-term adverse effects. So child may come in a very healthy state, but uh, because of the disease duration or a hospital uh, stay, if he is not fed appropriately or adequately, he may go into malnutrition. Uh, yeah, so the uh, points which we have to remember whenever we are planning, uh, here I am not discussing nutrition care process because ma'am has already uh, covered that part that which are the components of nutrition care process. So we will straight away talk about the practical aspects. Of course, nutrition care process is uh, the uh, way forward. And I am just trying to cover those points in a different way. So whenever you have to uh, plan the feeds, the thing which you have to remember is child's age, the clinical condition, the gastrointestinal function, possibility of oral intake, dietary habits and most importantly cost because we are a developing nation and I'm sure in the audience there are many dietitians who are coming from a background where the uh, the larger community the cost makes a lot of difference to what is being planned so that is why cost is very important by child's age because I told you pediatric population consists of 0 to 12 years so when you are going to give enteral nutrition support the tube, the size of the tube, the French size, the diameter of the tube will vary for a child who is a zero to one year old. Also for a child who is five to 10 year old and 10 to 12 year old. So depending on the diameter of the tube size, and that is why you need to 
uh, know the age of the child besides clinical condition because whatever is your plan, whatever feeds that are being planned, it has to pass through the tube. So it has to be the uh, the uh, the feeds which are planned have to be appropriate to go through that tube, and that's why knowing the age of the child is very very essential besides all other things. Now, whenever as the, she rightly said, nutrition screening again is one of the important uh, landmark of the nutrition care process. Now, to date, uh, the performance accuracy of these uh, uh, tools for children and adults are not being developed. Previous studies do not show any screening tool is superior, one screening tool is superior than other. So these have to be tailored for each hospital diagnosis and those with excellent reproducibility regardless of performers uh, uh, which are uh, regardless of performance must be developed i mean basically what we are trying to say is screening tool which is fit for your hospital should be developed in actual setting uh, it cannot be easily performed therefore healthcare professionals uh, uh, in hospitals must identify and use screening tool that is most appropriate for them and for their hospital setting. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity of the tool must be re-evaluated because which is which was uh, you know validated earlier may not work um, say after 10 years. So it has uh, with the actual outcomes of the hospital setting, most importantly, patients who are at risk of malnutrition should be treated and malnutrition must be prevented in these patients. Now, in the next slide, we I will show you these are some of the nutrition screening tools which are uh, used across different countries like France, uh, STAMP, which is used in UK, PYMS, which is used in e uh, UK, Netherlands, Greece, Australia. Basically, if you will see that in all these tools, it is mainly the anthropometry, the appetite or food intake diagnosis are some of the things which are used. Uh, as uh, the factors which are used in uh, the nutrition screening tools. But as I said, whichever tool you use, what is more important is addressing the malnutrition. Uh, now, once it is decided that we have to uh, give nutrition support, now let us see key, um, how and uh, classification by enteral axis. So firstly, we will decide whether nutrition support is required. If nutrition support, central nutrition support is not required, then patient will be given dietary advice and followed up. If nutrition support is required, then next thing that we have to do is check the functional gastrointestinal tract. If there is no functional gastrointestinal tract, then go for parenteral nutrition. If it's functional, then use it, then go for enteral nutrition. In enteral nutrition, you have to decide whether there is continuous need of nutrition support uh, required for more than four weeks. If not, if it is not required for more than four weeks, then and uh, check the risk of aspiration. And if it is not required for more than four weeks, it is for a shorter duration. Then, in case there is risk of aspiration then uh, go for post pyloric tube feeding that is nj naso naso jejunal feed and if there is risk of aspiration then go for uh, if there is no risk of aspiration go for nasogastric if there is risk of aspiration go for post pyloric feeding and if the nutrition support is required for more than 4 weeks as in case of esophageal atresia where there is absence of esophagus and if there is no risk of aspiration then go for gastrostomy feeding. And if there is risk of aspiration, then go for jejunostomy feeding. So this is how you will decide what route to choose when you decide that you want to go for uh, nutrition uh, classification based on nutrition support. Uh, yeah. So there are some absolute and some uh, relative contraindications for enteral nutrition. If there is problem with gastrointestinal function, like if there is gastroparesis or mechanical ileus and intestinal obstruction or perforation, then there is absolute contraindication. And in case of intestinal dysmotility, necrotizing, enterocolitis, and diffuse peritonitis, these are the conditions or high output enteric fistula 
that is relative contraindication for enteral nutrition support. Yeah. So we come to, as we saw in the earlier side, uh, there are sites and modes of delivery. So once it is established that we want to give enteral nutrition, then we will decide the location and route of uh, enteral nutrition. And again, that will be based on patient's disease status. Besides, we saw that risk of aspiration and all of that. Structural and functional status of gastrointestinal tract. Purpose and duration of enteral nutrition, as I told you, more than four weeks, less than four weeks, and risk uh, of aspiration. So if EN is required for more than four weeks, uh, as we saw earlier, in case of chronic diseases, which are associated with nutritional imbalances or nutritional abnormalities, like, say, um, cerebral palsy, neuromuscular disorders, here, uh, there is indication for PEG or digenostomy. If a page is also considered uh, for feeding and decompression, if there are malignant tumors of head, neck cancer or uh, chronic intestinal pseudo obstructions. Again, peg day feeding uh, has, why this uh, kind of feeding is preferred? Because it has fewer complications and discomfort, such as irritation, ulceration, bleeding, displacement, clogging, uh, than nasogastric tube feeding. However, it may be difficult to apply according to the abdominal wall and cooperative condition because we are dealing with small babies and they are so, I mean, their skins are also so sensitive and so fragile. So when we are deciding to go for PEG or PET, that is percutaneous endoscopic uh, gastrostomy or jejunostomy, you have to think about even the abdominal wall and uh, the cooperative condition of the patient. And then again, if the life expectancy also we have to think about because these are surgical procedures and uh, that's why that call needs to will be taken by the treating surgeon. Uh, now gastric feeding, uh, we will go talk a little bit more about if we are going to do gastric feeding, there is always a risk of, that is nasogastric feeding, there is always risk of gastroesophageal reflux or pulmonary aspiration, so one has to be careful. Uh, but with uh, gastric feeding, there is possibility of bolus feeding because position is fixed. It is easy to administer and stomach serves as a reservoir. And so it can play a bactericidal role where gastric hydrochloric acid it helps to absorb certain nutrients. There is intermittent bolus feeding also provides cyclic surge of gastrointestinal hormones because we are giving this feeding as tropic feedings at small intervals of say two hours or three hours. Hello. So uh, the intermittent bolus feeding uh, provides cyclic surge of gastrointestinal hormones because it has a tropic effect on intestinal mucosa and it allows and it also allows the patient free uh, uh, to perform activities and it is more physiologic. It does not require feeding pump. It is cheap also, but it carries risk of osmotic diarrhea. Okay. Uh, then we talk about post-pyloric feeding, that is feeding in the jejuna. Now, in case of gastroparesis, trach uh, tracheal aspiration, gastric outlet dysfunction, in these various conditions, we have to go a little further. So, when the tube is inserted, it goes right up to jejuna. Here, the uh, rapid infusion of nutrient is possible. So intermittent or continuous infusion has to be given. Uh, we will see what is intermittent and continuous. Again, I will remind you, it is covered by ma'am in earlier lecture. So I'm not going to talk about it. But here, there is a risk of hyperosmolar high energy feeds. Continuous feeding is delivered through infusion at a constant rate. Because you are providing feed, say, at uh, 10 ml per um, uh, 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 per minute, uh, not 10 ml, 1 cc per minute or 0.3 cc per uh, minute to whatever that rate of infusion. So there is continuous uh, stimulation to mucosa. This aids in intestinal adaptation and it allows optimal absorption. But again, it has its own uh, uh, problems because the feeding is continuous and you cannot expect the child or the patient to remain non-active for longer duration. But in certain conditions, that is what is indicated. Now we will see what are the complications of enteral nutrition. 
the complications could be mechanical, there could be infection, there are some metabolic complications like refeeding syndrome, gastrointestinal like bloating, cramping, abdominal discomfort, or there could be drug nutrient interaction which, um, uh, which uh, kind of hampers or which kind of, uh, you know, uh, complicates the enteral nutrition. Now, we will not uh, see the different kinds of these problems because we have to cover a lot. But just I will tell you in terms of mechanical problems, it could be catheter related. The tube may get, uh, the, you will miss the tube or the tube may, you know, uh, go here and there or it may get clogged. Infection site of, uh, at the site of that wound, if there is peg or pedge, the infection of that site or contamination of the formula. So these are the various uh, complications which you may face during enteral uh, feeding. Uh, now, just to talk a little bit about whether bolus uh, feeding is to be given or preferred or continuous drip. Again, as I said, both has its uh, ways and uh, pros and cons. The, the dietitian or the doctors or the team together takes the decision whether what kind of feeding is the best suited for that particular uh, patient. So bolus can mimic uh, or supplement a meal continuous. It's a slow, slow infusion, so it may improve tolerance and absorption. Bolus is more physiologic. Continuous can be given overnight to avoid disruption of daytime feeding. There is bolus may feeding uh, freedom of movement here. There is no freedom of movement, but it reduces the need for parental calories, uh, continuous drip feeding, and it encourages intestinal adaptation. And uh, But bolus feeding can promote osmotic diarrhea in continuous drip feeding. There are chances of osmotic diarrhea because if you make the feed hypercaloric. So again, that call will be taken by the treating dietitian. Now we will talk about feeding is decided, route of feeding is decided. Now we will talk about monitoring. Now what all needs to be monitored uh, when you are, because it doesn't end just, you know, planning the diet, planning the feeds. So you have to, uh, uh, means when you initiate the feeding, so initially you have to monitor these many things in hospital, these things are monitored and in outpatient. If patient is uh, comes on OPD basis, now I uh, here I am admitting that few of these slides I have taken from uh, Nasfagam. I did not see any reason why I should make any change in that because they are so well uh, designed. So and these are very valid things which are mentioned, and th this is what is done in the hospital. So the things to monitor is anthropometry, weight change on daily basis. Intake in terms of calorie protein fluid. Fluid, mind you, is very, very important in children. 70% of weight of the child is water. So basically, there is always chance that when you are calculating fluid, one should never miss calculating fluid when uh, you are planning the feed for a child. And you should always consult the treating physician when you are calculating feeds how much fluid is available to you to be given to enterly and how much is required to be given uh, through IV because certain medications are also given IV. And if you do not um, uh, you know, discuss it with the treating physician, there is always chance of child going in fluid overload. So mind you, uh, minding uh, fluid is very, very important when you are planning feeds for a pediatric patient. Then GI uh, tolerance, then stool, if there are ostomies with the volume of the stool frequency and consistency, tube placement, you have to ensure that it is proper and uh, at an accurate place. Uh, then the tube site, tube site should be monitored uh, daily and especially with children. The length of the tube at the end of the lecture, very briefly, I will show you how the length of the tube is calculated because mind you, the length from nose to the stomach is very short and the length of the tube, if it is very long, the lot of tube is going to dangle outside, which is going to cause irritation. So all these minor things as a dietitian, you also should be aware and you should pay attention to. Uh, these things are taken care normally by the doctors, but as a dietitian, you must know, you must learn from them how it is calculated and why. Uh, now, when you are doing evaluation, 
uh, which are the problems which may you may uh, come across it could be diarrhea abdominal cramping vomiting nausea hyperglycemia so in case of diarrhea you can reduce uh, the delivery rate or you can uh, check which drugs are given because too many antibiotics also may be the reason for diarrhea consider fiber containing products in case of uh, vomiting and nausea check ki what is the temperature of your feed elevate the head of the bed consider post pyloric feeding or continuous drip feeding in case of hyperglycemia reduce the flow uh, rate use formulas which have minimal simple sugars or consider insulin if it is clinically indicated again that call will be taken by the doctor it is not your call uh if there is constipation gastric retention of formula or clogged feeding again i have listed a uh, few things which uh, i mean the intervention which should be done in case of constipation and gastric retention of formula or clogged feeding again i am really hurrying up because uh because we really do not have time and i have few more slides to show if you want to come back to these slides we will come back later during question answer so once it is decided that we are going to feed the patient the next question which comes to our mind is which formula uh, to be given so uh, the thing right now i will just introduce you to few of the formulas which are available there are lactose modified formulas hydrolyzed formulas partially hydrolyzed formulas now lactose modified formulas are milk protein based or soy protein based where uh, the source of carbohydrate will be uh, co corn maltodextrin corn syrup solid or sucrose in hydrolyzed formulas again the uh, depending on degree of hydrolysis these will be partially hydrolyzed formulas which are called phf then there will be there are extensively hydrolyzed formulas ehf and amino acid formulas while amino acid formulas are referred to as elemental formulas ehf and phf are called semi elemental formulas the lesser the degree of intact protein enhances the immunological tolerability so extensively herb, uh, hydrolyzed formulas are made using um, by hydrolyzing milk protein to peptide size which does not result in immune response indication cow's milk and soy protein allergy uh, i mean the indication for using extensively hydrolyzed formula is that there is cow's milk or soy milk uh, soy protein allergy so also if there is malabsorption due to intestinal failure short bowel syndrome as well as crohn's disease then there are amino acid based formulas which are basically uh, used in parenteral nutrition i am not going to uh, talk right now too much about it then there are mct based formulas as per guideline a formula which contains 30 to 80% of mct is called mct based formula the indication is liver disease malabsorption malnutrition short bowel syndrome or uh, cptd uh, deficiency etc then there are specific formulas which are for inborn errors of metabolism the iem children with metabolic defects involving either essential amino acids uh, supplementation or or uh, you know we will see little more uh, about it in our following slides so uh, basically you have to remember now liquid pediatric formulas are not available in india as per my knowledge but the content or the the, the composition remains the same but we have it in powdered formula so the protein carbohydrate fat uh, i have written here ki in case of i mean what are the uh, sources of protein the source of carbohydrate could be sucrose or maltodextrin or corn syrup or cranberry juice or fruits and vegetables in case of fat it is mostly vegetable oil which may contain mct and the osmolarity as if you remember mam had told the correct osmolarity is 335 to 350 Our maximum in case of blenderized tube feeding formulas, three eighty. Now uh, these formulas may contain fiber. The flavor may vary. There could be gluten. Uh, they are gluten and lactose free. And um, yeah, uh, when when it comes to semi-elemental formulas, here uh, the protein is enzymatically hydrolyzed way. Uh, carbohydrate could be maltodextrin, corn syrup, solid, 
MCT, 60% of calories will come from uh, MCT. Similarity again as shown here, the formulation, again, I have shown you the formulation of these semi-elemental formulas, which are peptide-based uh, formulas. Uh, then there are special infant formulas, uh, specialty infant formulas, which are uh, elemental, hydrolyzed. Here again, I have shown you the different composition. And as I said, these slides are available on the net. Uh, now, there are certain metabolic infant formulas which are uh, required for specific disease conditions like phenylketonuria, methyl syrup disease, and uh, then there will be carbohydrate-free formulas required, or there will be modified fat formulas which are required, or formulas with reduced mineral content, as in case of renal disease. Um, now, the addition of probiotic and prebiotic is seen that uh, evidence for decreased infectious illness, especially diarrheal illness. Uh, I mean, there is some evidence. So, nowadays, uh, certain infant formulas may contain probiotics and prebiotic formulas are also given because they contain growth factors that foster the growth of good bacteria in the gut, like uh, inulin or fructooligosaccharides, which are part of the uh, formulas. Now, these are some of the formulas which are available in India. I have given you the list of these formulas which are available here, uh, <laughs> naming the companies and the formulas which are available. Uh, going next, uh, we, as I told you, we are going to talk a little bit about refitting syndrome. Now, when the child comes to your setup who is not fed for a very long duration because of his disease status or because of whatever reason, um, he is in a non-fed state for a very long time. And that's why aggressively uh, giving aggressive nutrition support can lead to various complications. What, what one must understand is that during this phase, there are metabolic and clinical changes that occur during nutrition support of malnourished patient. First of all, there is severe malnutrition. Then there is significant weight loss. Or uh, if the child is obese, uh, there is massive weight loss. It All of this leads to, or there could be undernutrition because patient is on long-term IV therapy. And all this uh, kind of puts that pediatric patient at risk of refeeding syndrome. So whenever you are calculating uh, for uh, when you begin feeding, what needs to be done that we will see in uh, following slides. So which are the serum abnormalities which are seen during refeeding? One is hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, glucose abnormalities, thiamine deficiency and derangement of sodium, nitrogen and fluid balance. And that is why uh, the principles of refeeding syndrome is patients have altered metabolism that you must understand. They, there is severe intracellular deficiency of several electrolytes that are important for cell function like phosphorus, potassium, magnesium. The initial management should focus on correction of metabolic mechanisms and electrolyte repetition prior to initiating aggressive nutrition support because it can have life-threatening consequences. Aggressive refeeding in the initial phase and rehydration can prove deadly if deficiencies are not anticipated, corrected, or monitored carefully. Now, here, protein intake does not uh, require restriction. Now, so you have to identify patients who are at risk of refeeding, start refeeding at 50 to 75 percent goal. Protein does not need to be restricted. Rehydrate carefully. Again, this will be done by the doctors and monitor uh, calcium, phosphorus, potassium. Doctors will do that. But you have to be aware of all this before encouraging tube feeding uh, or going for aggressive nutrition support. As I told you, I will just show you the tube measure which is used to feed it is from 3 French to 10 French, depending on the age and weight of the child. The tube length calculation, if it is orogastric tube, then it is 3, factor of 3 into weight of the child plus 12. And for nasogastric tube, it is 3 into weight of the child plus 17. Now, ENN failure to thrive, just last two slides, uh, Sukhada, I'm really uh, sorry, I'll just run through it. 
in case of failure to try child with neurological disorders may have affects swallowing and predis uh, they may be predisposed to aspiration they have increased caloric needs uh, uh, but in each of these conditions trial of ng feeds may be more appropriate children who require ng feeds for greater than 4 to 8 weeks may benefit from gastrostomy tube uh, replacement uh, uh, just one last slide about feeding preterm infant infants who are born prematurely with low birth weight are predisposed to poor outcome research shows that appropriate nutrition care of preterm infant can positively influence early growth and development intrauterine accretion of nutrients occurs mainly in later part of third trimester so if the child is born before that so he is born with low body stores of macro and micronutrients and so he has higher requirements their need for key nutrients have to be estimated depending on the fetal growth uh, uh, then intestinal absorption of fetal Uh, preterm infants and on the basis of human milk composition for term infants the frequency of the feeding will be decided by weight age gestational age and clinical condition and the feed will be through nasogastric or orogastric tube of bolus over 10 to 12 20 minutes so this is the chart which is given uh, how you should uh, whether to give bolus or continuous feeding and uh, now this is one uh, one uh, this which i came across i feel all of you should go and read back it is really wonderful oh, uh, you know both these um, uh, uh, these uh, two papers which i came across made interesting reading so i have just quoted it but again whether nutrition guidelines are followed strictly or not strictly uh, uh, that is again uh, debatable uh i am just going to skip this side it talks about neonatologist but since we are short of time i'm not going to talk about it ultimately it is the team uh, who uh, will decide uh, or who will achieve good results and the team includes a dietitian a treating physician or a surgeon nurse physiotherapist the caregiver and most uh, i mean the most important the patient and the mother of the child or the parents of the ba baby so all of us together can you know uh, put our hands together to achieve good re results thank you for the patient hearing and i am really very sorry if i have uh, you know gone Ramit, beyond the time <laughs> i'm totally sorry thank you so much for covering this topic i'll quickly move on to the panel so that uh, we have enough time to take as many questions as possible so it gives me pleasure to introduce our panelist so this panel is from across uh, we ha have our first two speakers dr alka jadhav ma'am and jashri baranspe ma'am our next panelist is ms megha tese manke she is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator she has nutrition fellowship from tata memorial hospital and she was working with hexagon as assistant manager technical marketing and she would handle pan india uh, technical aspects of marketing welcome megha a next panelist is dr rita patel she is a vice principal and hod of food and nutrition department at manipur nanavati uh, nanavati college she is lc of idea mumbai chapter and treasurer of ipn mumbai chapter she has also has a, a lot of publications in books international journals and recently has also got an award for her uh, you know research work that she has been carrying out our next panelist is mr robert kemboy uh, he is a nutrition officer 3 at kenyatta hospital in kenya he has a bachelor of technology in human nutrition and dietetics and he's worked as a tutor at nairobi aviation college he also has a nutrition attachment at moa teaching and referral hospital at eldoret and he's been with kenyatta hospital we had him in the last panel for cancer as well so his specialization is in oncology and he's going to cover the aspects of pediatric oncology today our next speaker is all the way from uganda ms tella damuluria she has a bsc from university of eastern africa baritone um she is been a candidate at msc at kabadak university 
and also has a postgraduate in programming pediatric nutrition from Boston University School of Medicine. She's been working with Nakasero Hospital and she also has a lot of publications and been part of various programs in the government sector as well. So welcome Ms. Taylor once again. She was also part of our previous panel. Um, it's my privilege to have Megha as the co-moderator today. Apologies, I have been a little under the, under the weather, so Megha is going to help me out. But let me start with the first question for Megha. Megha, malnutrition is a double-edged sword and you being a new mom, uh, what are some of the deficiencies that we see in children? And how are they different in an underweight child versus an overweight or an obese child? Sure, ma'am. Thank you for the brief introduction. Uh, you're right, ma'am. So actually, as Dr. Alga said, it's a triple uh, burden to our society, which is the coexistence of overnutrition, overweight and obesity, and along with undernutrition, that is stunting and wasting, and not to forget micronutrient deficiency. So well, vitamin A, uh, vitamin D, and iron deficiency are the main forms of micronutrient deficiency in children. However, each country will predispose these uh, various deficiencies depending on the staple food consumption they have in their country. However, now what we see is high fat, high sugar, processed food being consumed by children across the world, adding to their overall carbohydrate and fat intake with a very less room for micronutrients in their diet. Uh, so if you see urbanization um, uh, is increasing at a very fast pace, we see fast moving consumer goods uh, reaching the uh, uh, rural population so quickly with the robust supply chain. Uh, some products being cost effective are being consumed by these rural children, uh, in, uh, I mean, giving them nothing but empty calories, high in fats. And some of these products are biscuits, uh, cream biscuits, um, then so or sodas, smoothies, juices, which are high in sugar, chocolates which are speci specially designed in small packs are cost effective and therefore accessible to these children. So what they get is mostly empty calories, giving more of carbs in their overall diet. But speaking about micronutrients and in undernourished kids, uh, if you see vitamin A deficiency, so in 1970, a national nutrition profile access program um, was um, started against uh, night blindness due to vitamin A deficiency with a specific aim to eradicate this deficiency, which was initially started in 9 to 36 months of age and revised to 6 to 56, 59 months of age. It showed a good in impact for few months until supplemented, but as you know, body cannot produce its own vitamin A. And as we consume uh, the vitamin A, it is stored in our liver. Okay, so any kind of illness will deplete the store of these vitamin A. Uh, similarly, therefore, a holistic approach of supplementation, along with supplementation, a major focus should be given on seasonal and the local fruits and vegetables. Okay, so again, uh, here the question arises is of affordability. Okay, many, uh, many people in particular population cannot afford fruits and vegetables as well, and therefore they rely on mostly staple food which is uh, mostly carb based high in carbs so however staple foods are now being fortified and also being standardized and this fortification has been standardized by fssi which can be consumed by mass population giving enough micronutrients in our diet so similarly if you see uh, there is iron deficiency in young children uh, there is uh, in adolescent girls, pregnant and lactating women. In fact, zinc being abundant in our body, which is very crucial for protein synthesis, as ma'am said, it's good for immune building, cellular differentiation, many other functions. This is also, zinc is also deficient in most of the undernourished kids, leading to loss of appetite, growth retardation, and also impaired immune function. So this, uh, what we spoke is about ruler population and undernutrition is mostly seen in this population. Again, talking about urban population, there was a study which was conducted last year in May 2022 on the prevalence of specific micronutrient deficiency in urban school going children in India. And what they saw uh, was a more, um, the major mineral is calcium, uh, which is deficient. I mean, these kids are deficient is calcium and iron followed by iron. But zinc and uh, uh, selenium, they were least efficient in. Similarly, for vitamin, vitamin A, folate and vitamin D were deficient. I mean, the quarter of the population, the subject uh, for this study, the quarter of the subjects were deficient in vitamin D, folate and uh, uh, vitamin B12, whereas vitamin A was least deficient. 
So what we see is we can relate this uh, deficiency in both malnourished categories, which are attributed mostly to the environmental and socio-economic uh, factors. So what we see is in spite of the nutritional programs, we still see various gaps or, you know, ups and downs in the number of data, stat statistical data each year because large population of our country is still suffering from anemia, is still suffering from vitamin A deficiency, which needs to be addressed through maybe revisiting the national nutrition program or introducing a program which can target uh, maybe the entire population. Uh, so uh, with that, I would like to ask the uh, next question to uh, Dr. Alka, ma'am. Uh, like, uh, what is your experience uh, by using this therapeutic supplements in uh, malnourished kids in community level? I mean, have you prescribed any of it uh, to a specific uh, cases? Yeah, actually, we have worked with our integrated child development scheme where they give take-home ration, which is also micronutrient fortified. And it has promoted the growth and development to the child. We also have a separate preparation like MNP, that is micronutrient powder. Or it is also, uh, we have five, I can't take the official name, but we have around five micronutrients which can be sprinkled over the diet. And we have tried it out in the rural areas of Jawhar and Mukhada, which are very much interior rural areas. And it actually showed a good weight gain as well as a good height gain in one year time. It was a case control study. So along with this, we also have prepared various supplementary food, like chickpea based supplementary programs. Maybe as a traditionally, it may be the basin laddus or it may come as uh, uh, augmented home foods, but it is also called, are you ready to use supplementary food? It may be a soy based food, which is also uh, there. So we have used, actually our study was published where we have used instead of peanut, we have used soy, processed soya flour, and it actually reduced the cost by two thirds, you know. So, or at least 50%. So these are the programs which can be really used where we can replace them with standard or conventional RUTF where we have used these second class proteins, maybe chickpea, maybe corn soya blend, maybe traditional home gud papdi or the rava besan laddus, you know, which can be made out of and it will, along with micronutrients, it will give good results. So, which means diversified diet is actually important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, with this, uh, I would like to ask the next question to Dr. Rita, ma'am. Since you have worked extensively with school children, what is your experience across uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds? Thank you, Megha. Oh, please excuse me. I think I will be switching off my video for a while because something that is wrong with the camera right now. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the most important thing that I've noticed in across the socioeconomic uh, groups, there, there are certain differences in the rural and the urban areas. In urban areas, you'll find that uh, across socioeconomic groups, there is double malnutrition. Whereas when you go in towards the rural areas, you'll find there is definitely the triple burden of malnutrition. Micronutrient deficiencies are more towards the rural areas, particularly for iron. Calcium still may not be so much, but iron definitely and vitamin D, surprisingly, even if they are in the uh, exposed to sunlight, whatever it is, you'll find that there is vitamin D in both the uh, areas. But coming back to the urban areas, you'll find that the eating habits have drastically changed. Like you rightly pointed out that the processed foods are cheaper, fruits and vegetable intakes have reduced. And therefore we find that this, I cannot even say that it's only the lower socioeconomic which are malnourished, you know, the upper socioeconomic group children are also equally malnourished. Uh, malnourished. And I'm not talking of overweight and obesity in them. They are equally underweight as well. And so, uh, it's a very peculiar situation if you look at the, the differences in the urban and uh, uh, rural may be there, 
but we the bottom line is that we are going to be facing malnutrition if the eating habits are not rectified for almost everybody thank you ma'am absolutely and uh, here we are very curious to know um, uh, from ms tela what are the different national nutrition programs that are conducted in uganda for bringing down the malnutrition numbers in the country thank you mega thank you everyone the panelists i appreciate very good sharing of knowledge it has been power packed we appreciate thank you so much uh there are different programs here in uganda there are quite many but the basic one is that one that is followed by or recommended by who which is the imam abbreviated as imam integrated malnutrition management of acute malnutrition so it's the basic one that is being used and that is what is followed mainly in the main referral hospitals and a guideline to many nutritionists which is more like what doctor presented in the first presentation it follows the assessment of the infant whether you start them on an inpatient basis or outpatient clinic depending on the level of the child is what is normally assessed and guiding mm -hmm. and then uh, has the child come in very ill are they having any underlying conditions do you have to assess for further uh, clinical conditions do they have uh, tuberculosis is it mainly malnutrition due to deficiency because they haven't been eating well and then many of the micronutrients are trending down so that category is being followed strictly and it's the basis at which children are, are being fed uh, it's it's normally called the imam in abbreviation <clears throat> excuse me integrated malnutrition management yes so they you find that in such in such clinics they give they give rotaf that are FUT. Uh, they can start the child on F75. They can give F100 as the child is improving. Then they test them for their appetite. Then the sachets with peanut will be started on. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Della. Uh, mm -hmm. So, my next question uh, goes to uh, Jayshree, ma'am. You have shown a, a very good classification of all the formulas. However, few of the formulas are disease specific and only for adults. So do all children require, again, uh, do all children require uh, protein supplementation? And how do we decide the kind of supplement to be used for a particular child? And do standard formula work well with these children? Uh, do, I mean, the answer to your question is, uh, uh, there is no standard formula uh, because as I told you earlier that when we are talking about uh, 0 to 12 age group, so it's a big age group, there cannot be a particular formula which fits all the uh, age groups. It is also we all have to think about uh, the infants. Now, whenever drill feeding is initiated for whatever reason in infants, it is the express breast milk, which is considered as the first uh, enteral feed, you know, of choice. So if mother is not able to feed, uh, I mean, because of the disease condition, she is asked to express out the milk and that milk is uh, given through the tube. The disease specific ones have their role, especially in case of inborn errors of metabolism. In older children, we can use uh, the adult formula, standard formulas. There again, the uh, I mean the dilution can be decided by uh, the dietitian how much ever protein that is required, the deficit which we can meet. Because many a times uh, during their hospital stay or many a times children have lactose intolerance. So whenever there is lactose intolerance, we will have to use either lactose-free formulas or uh, you know low lactose formulas. It is not always lactose-free formulas which are required. Okay, so depending on the condition, it will vary. Uh, I am sure. I mean, uh, if Dr. Jada, uh, ma'am, wants to add to whatever I have said, ma'am, your uh, experience in this. And at times we, yeah, just uh, one minute, we also prepare certain special feeds in our uh, 
facility so for when the tube for the bigger children when the tube is little the diameter of the tube is little bigger to which we can give blenderized formulas or modify rudf which is prepared in our uh, kitchen facility or we use arf flour arf mix to prepare these feeds because not everyone can afford commercial supplements although at times it might be required so uh, as i said depending on the age of the child his gi condition uh, it will be decided which formula to choose and um, i would like dr alka ma'am to you know yeah. add her give her input yeah actually uh, to the best of my knowledge we really don't go for commercial infant formula because of we have a very strong infant milk substitute act yes so Huh. So that the reason is then that uh, obviously we do not want to break the rules, but what commercial, what we make at home or what we make for the children for growing them, is either we have two three examples. We can have egg flip, we have banana flip, we have paneer laddus which can be made. Rice mung dal paste which is augmented and given. So depending on the condition. if the child does not have diarrhea and if the child is tube fed we can give these options which are available easily in our kitchen and then the dietitian or then the doctor decides that depending on his calorie intake and the liking and the taste of the child's preference he will give we do not really have any non vegetarian items available in our kitchen but non vegetarian items we can easily give them chicken uh, uh, chicken soup if it is really made available yeah in enteral nutrition ma'am i would like to add that in enteral nutrition support at times yes i agree that we have a policy of not using this but especially in inborn errors yeah or yeah. in certain conditions we have to use these uh, products as i said and if the tube size is very small things like even the mct oil which is used so it becomes like a supplement only which will make the uh, yeah. denser so i meant it that way thank you definitely thank you it's uh, mostly if you are using supplements it's on a clinical judgment of a dietitian that uh, she prescribe or the uh, yeah. formula or the commercial ones maybe okay. like uh, let me say something to uh, also on that note uh, on our side we also discourage supplements unless otherwise yeah it's only introduced if there is really really need for it maybe the deficiencies are complicated or lack of intolerance the child is not tolerating the feed that is being given that is when a supplement will be called in okay absolutely uh so my next question goes to uh, uh mr robert uh children with cancer in addition to being malnourished will be cachexic so what is your take on starting early enteral nutrition in such children how do you ensure the better tolerance of these supplements uh th thank you so much um linda for for the question um however um uh these children who come are you can you hear me yes yes i speak in hindi okay now i'm saying that um uh, the first stage uh, in management of malnutrition that is associated with cancer is actually screening i think that is the entry point of um that makes a basis of planning for these patients who have uh, cancer and uh, um malnutrition 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 um due to cancer is actually associated with so many factors which uh, which uh play role in uh, ensuring that um, there is a reduced intake of uh, nutrients by that uh, specific uh, child uh, and uh, these side effects maybe could be side effects caused by uh, cancer treatment medication that is uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy or even other modes of um uh management especially if it is a targeted chemotherapy or radiotherapy or palliative 
radiotherapy, um, chemotherapy, or rather a hormonal uh, treatment. However, uh, we cannot actually go direct to the management of um, uh, 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 malnutrition associated with cancer, uh, but we need to see actually uh, when we say uh, cachexia, what is this cachexia? And uh, many books uh, de uh, explain or define uh, cachexia as, um, as uh, the most uh, is mostly uh, and frequently seen in the late and advanced stage of cancer. Uh, patients, especially stage four, depending on the categorization and also depending on the, the type of cancer. We have those cancers which are just localized uh, on a specific uh, place in the body. And we have uh, the aggressive cancers which are, um, uh, which metastasize to other parts of the body. And depending on the cancer, all cancer uh, produces a substances, we call it a tumor necrotic factor. We have also cytokines. We have other things we call uh, alpha one and six um, um, interleukins, which affects the reduces the levels of iron uh, in these cancer patients. And that's why you see most of these cancer patients, most of them are, are given uh, blood transfusion, either platelets or a whole blood. Uh, the the tumor necrotic factor, uh, the cytokines are responsible for elevating the nutritional requirements. The requirements for energy goes up, up to 1.5%, um, 1, 1, uh, 150% compared to individual who is normal without cancer because of the catabolism. The catabolism um, causes a massive breakdown of body tissues uh, which uh, actually causes, which will lead to exploitation or uh, the use of the stores of energy, especially the glycogen and the body muscles, and also the albumin levels tend to come down. And therefore, um, this reduction in food intake is actually due to a uh, loss of appetite. We have uh, impaired ingestion, and also absorption of the nutrients is also affected. And uh, some of the other patients uh, before pre pre-chemo or pre-cancer treatment, they, they experience diarrhea. No, they, they don't experience these episodes of diarrhea or loose uh, stools. They don't uh, experience uh, constipation or anorexia. But once the treatment commences, now these patients uh, start experiencing a diarrhea, constipation, anorexic, become anorexic. Uh, changes in taste and also um, which will affect the uh, nutrients intake. However, having said so, uh, uh, the management of um, specific side effects of the drugs uh, is, inter is intervened differently. But um, uh, in uh, my practice or in our practice, it's a collaborative effort by the oncologist, the nursing care, uh, the nutritionist, the, the, the physiotherapy, the occupation therapy, to ensure that this patient is attended holistically. Holistically. And therefore, um, uh, uh, during the commencement of the treatment of cancer, uh, as a, some patients experience immense side effects of the drugs, some uh, don't experience uh, such a wider range of the effects of um, of these uh, uh, drugs and um, manifestation or um, the, the range of wasting um, is manifested differently. And therefore, uh, the first line uh, management that we are using uh, in our facility is using uh, commercial um, feeds, that is uh, therapeutic supplements, and also kitchen feeds, which are tailored towards um, towards meeting the nutritional status of this patient, both the macronutrients and the micronutrients, because micronutrients, those are the vitamins and the minerals are responsible for metabolism. And therefore, um, a, giving a, a whole, a whole a package of food uh, that comprises of macro and micro um, micronutrients helps to prevent other, um, other, other complications uh, of uh, maybe metabolism, 
and also utilization of these nutrients. Uh, unlike uh, the previous um, presenter who said that um, th there is a silent killer, uh, that is a silent deficiency, that is micro micronutrients, that is the vitamins and the minerals, which we need actually to incorporate them. So um, in managing all these patients, we have to put in mind that this patient requires both macro and micro uh, nutrients, and also management of the side effects. Understanding also the the, side, the nutrients uh, uh, we have also the pain management in this patient require. Remember, these patients uh, who are cancer experience immense immense um, pain, and that also could be another effect that uh, causes uh, reduced food intake. Yeah, so it's a holistic approach where not only on nutrition but the entire uh, team effort is needed because it's a extreme catabolic state uh, during the treatment of these children. So you're absolutely right. Uh, so moving on to uh, my next question to Dr. Rita, uh, because since we are speaking about malnutrition, uh, some special children also require, uh, you know, support of supplements. So you have been working extensively in ch with children with special needs like cerebral palsy. Now, depending on their oral uh, development, the type of food allowed is different. So do you sense a need for early supplementation in these children to prevent malnutrition and improve therapy outcomes? Uh, yes, Mega, definitely. These children have a huge amount of feeding problems. We are unable to give them the normal feed and each child has some special uh, need where in, ter in terms of how they are going to be fed, they have swallowing problems and the amount of feeding problems that are there existing, as soon as it is known that they are going to have feeding problems, supplementation should begin because otherwise these children will go into deficiencies and this is what happens. Initially, every uh, bit of effort is taken to make sure that they are given. Also, these children as they grow are tempted towards every uh, junk food possible, though we don't use the word junk anymore. Every of these processed foods they are attracted towards like normal children and they tend to be demanding that. So all the more reason why they should be given uh, supplements from the time they are known. Of course, the nutritional assessment is done, but it should be done periodically every three or six months so that you will be able to identify if there are more deficiency signs which are developing. But supplementation to these children is necessary. I personally felt while I was working with these that a lot of education to the parents and the caregivers is necessary because some of them tend to say that this medicine is not needed. Is the doctor giving me unnecessary medication? And that itself has to be explained to them because uh, then once this malnutrition sets in to make them come back to a normal nutritional status is more difficult compared to normal children. Absolutely. Uh, Mika, just one second. Can I add something to what uh, Rita said? With cases of cerebral palsy and, uh, uh, you know, these conditions, intervention or help of a speech therapist or a swallowing expert is also equally very important because we may tell them what to eat, but how to feed the child because they have feeding technique difficulties. So they need to be taught. Otherwise, there is always tons of aspiration and all of that so help uh, taking help of us following expert also uh, should be considered when you are treat, we are treating cerebral palsy children or yes you know, jashree you're yeah. very right and uh, from what i've seen that uh, whichever institution they are attached with or even doctors they start them on these experts uh, help as soon as they can so uh, they try to make sure that the food intake is improved and getting better. But yes, these uh, with swallowing problems and uh, other uh, feeding issues, definitely malnutrition will exist with these children if not supplemented. Thank I you. think I can add something on the feeding. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, at times, uh, you may find that these children uh, may present with aggressive uh, cancers, which uh, causes obstruction, intestinal obstruction or blockage, or difficulty in swallowing. So uh, designing a method of nutrient delivery is also key. 
in uh, in ensuring that um, you maintain the nutrition status of this patient. At some point, uh, the patients who may uh, experience a intense uh, vomiting or uh, high rates of um, education for parental or uh, the, the goals of dietary management of patients who are um, diagnosed with cancer should have uh, to should ensure that um, uh, the individual patients get adequate supply of the nutrients uh, in order to prevent uh, the protein energy malnutrition and also to improve the nutritional status, maybe to maintain or to improve. Uh, again, um, uh, the, the, the other goal is actually to prevent the weight loss, uh, which is associated with the side effects of the drugs, that is the chemo, uh, radiotherapy, and also to reduce susceptibility to infection. Remember, uh, when a patient is not able to take uh, oral adequately, oral nutrients adequately, uh, that equates to uh, lowering the immunity of that uh, particular patient. And therefore, um, uh, uh, giving uh, adequate uh, uh, nutrients in terms of both macro and micro helps to prevent uh, the glycolysis, the uh, lipolysis, uh, 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 proteolysis, gluconeogenesis, which is actually an uh, indicator for um, weight loss. And therefore, um, using a specific parameters like uh, the creatinine levels, the albumin levels, um, the urea levels to ascertain uh, whether the patient is getting adequate nutrients and also how is the, how is the metabolism? Is the liver um, uh, stressed? Then you may also to ensure to make plan uh, a diet that uh, ensure that um, you maintain um, the liver, uh, the, the organ liver and also not to cause more harm on a specific uh, organs uh, that uh, a key role, plays a key role in metabolism of the nutrients. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Robert. So uh, the panel discussion is really very interesting. We can go on with more questions. Uh, there are a few participants who are raising hand, but I would request them to put uh, their question in the Q&A box and we'll manage to answer them uh, if possible to, uh, via mail. Uh, for now, uh, we've understood about malnutrition, malnutrition in uh, ca cancer children's, overall malnutrition also in special children's. So it's a vast topic which needs a holistic approach, a team approach by all the clinicians, also by our dietitians, and also a, a, a precautionary, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 measure is to be taken because this, whether it be RUTF, whether it be, um, you know, therapeutic uh, formula, whether it be commercialized formula, always to be taken by a supervision from a doctor or a dietitian and not to be taken in at home level. So that is very important because I saw a question around uh, uh, that. And uh, thank you, Alka, ma'am, because uh, all the questions were answered uh, in the Q&A uh, box as well. I would uh, thank all the panelists for attending, uh, for answering all the questions. It was a very nice panel discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, a concern? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Topin. Yeah, I, I think uh, we need to have um, uh, maybe an exchange program. That is what I can request that we have an exchange program with uh, maybe you, India and Kenya and also maybe Uganda so that we can see on how we can help these young children, these patients who are getting, um, who are diagnosed with cancer. And there is a high rise of cancer nowadays in, in, our, in our settings. Only Mr. Robert, we have just started, uh, so we have a long way to go, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. we'll definitely come together and work for the larger good. Thank you all the panelists for being here. Um, all the participants, the feedback link is in the chat box. Please copy it. It's, it will not be emailed to you. Um, also, the recordings will be available to you from the from 1st of March. So it will be available to you. Click on the link, subscribe to the channel, and you should be able to access the link to all the recordings so far. So you get a chance to revise before you attempt the test which will be posted again in the chat box on 8th of March, 2023. Thank you all. See you tomorrow at 7 p.m. IST. Thank you.
Thank you, Sukhada. Thank you, Exergen and IDA Mumbai chapter. Thank you so much. It is not tomorrow. Is it going to be tomorrow? Okay, it's tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we are having back to back two sessions this time. Okay, okay. So thank you, everyone. And Dr. Robert, your I cannot unmute myself, and I want to you to see me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and sharing.